1961, there were 13,000 Jews in Palestine, representing 4% of the population. In 1881, there were 25,000, 5%. 1900, there were 8%. 1914, they had already reached 13%. But with the war and everything, everything stopped, immigration stopped. So from 1914 to 1919, to 1924, we had a very stable 13%. But then, once the World War was over, once it was possible to emigrate, more and more Jews started emigrating. However, at this point, the majority of Jews around the world did not believe in the need for a national home and believed that they should be living in the countries where they are. But that's a whole different subject. I don't want to di digress because we have enough things to cover here. So from, from 1924 to 31, the percentage would jump to 17. From 31 to 36, it would go to 27 because the Jewish agency would be illegally bringing immigrants into Palestine by every possible way. And suddenly, by 1948, we're at one-third of the population being Jews in Palestine. They were one-third of the population. They had Rothschild funds, open account. They were very keen to buy land. They were offering exceptional prices for land. Still, you will see that the land, that the percentage of land owned by Jews is very, very low. Even in 1947-48, they owned 6.6% of the land. So they were a third of the population, but they were 6% of the land. Now this brings us to what's happening in Iraq and Syria during these 20s to the late 40s. Syria is under <coughs> French colonial rule, or mandate, whatever you want to call it. Artificial colonial borders were established in 1920 through the League of Nations. Puppet local governments formed to carry out French wishes. Political activity suppressed. Weapon ownership not allowed and very highly restricted and enforced. Local police were always backed by French troops who really ruled the day. And a French attempt was still made because the, the entity just didn't fit together so-called Syria. So they thought maybe it might be a good idea to divide the country into uh, cantons that at least will rule themselves. So. The Shiite Alawites could be, this is where they are mostly found, so they thought maybe we can have a statelet there for them. The Druze, which is another ethnic group, perhaps they could be in this southern part of Syria. And then we divide it, given that there are two major cities here, we divide the rest of the Sunni land mainly into two statelets again. They tried it for a couple of years, it didn't work. They forgot about it. Uh, if we look at an ethnic map of Syria, again you have the Alawites here, Shiite. All this blue is Sunni. And these yellow are in the north are Kurds. I'm not going fast enough. We have to speed up. Lebanon used to be this. The French decided to add extra land to it. They added the south of Lebanon, which is all Shiite Muslims. They were peasants who worked in the fields. That would be useful for the Christian landlords in the North Lebanon. And they added some more Shiites and Sunnis here. And hence, this resulted in all the chaos in Lebanon and the civil wars that continued. Iraq is under British colonial rule. Artificial colonial borders were established, puppet local governments, Faisal was the king, 
Iraq granted independence by 1932, but very heavy British presence and control. Military corps flourished with the king's authority. Military coups flourished with the king's authority weakening over time. Eventually, it's thrown out, and by 1958, the military take over in Iraq. Two issues with Iraq. Mosul was supposed to be part of Syria because of its actually because of its ethnically being connected to the Kurds. It ends up in Iraq, but it was not originally meant to be part of Iraq. The second issue is this little state here called Kuwait, which used to be part of Iraq historically, but because the British had signed an agreement with the emir or ruler of the, or the headman of that tribe there, they figured, let's keep it separate. It's better. We can divide and rule. We leave Kuwait out. That explains why Saddam Hussein later would claim it. So this is how ethnically today Iraq is. Shiites here, Sunnis here, and Kurds up here. We'll see how that's playing out today. In November of 47, there's a plan for partition of Palestine. United Nations plan calls for an independent Arab and Jewish states. Now we're talking of two-state solution. Remember, that's what's coming today. A special international regime for the city of Jerusalem, administered by the United Nations. So Jerusalem would be internationalized. Who voted for that? 33 countries voted for the establishment of the State of Israel, including the United States and the Soviet Union. Thirteen included, uh, uh, voted against, including the bordering countries Greece and Turkey, but, uh, and Egypt. Ten abstentions, including, of all things, the UK. I wash my hands. I have nothing to do with Palestine. You decide. United Nations, what you want to do with it. I'm not for a Jewish state, you know? So the partition called, ironically, for a state that is in bits and pieces. This is the land that was given to the Jews, the orange. The yellow was given to the Arabs. These two parts were not connected. These two parts were not connected. These parts were barely connected. These parts were barely connected. There's supposed to be a corridor for them to run through. This is the land that was the land that was owned by the Jews before partition. Overnight, they go from 6.6% of the land to 56% of the land given to the State of Israel by the United Nations. The Arabs reject participation. The Zionist movement reluctantly agrees. The Arab states start putting together a ragtag army of fighters. They're just coming out of independence, into independence. And the overnight, the Israeli militias are changed into the Israeli defense forces declared the same day that Palestine was partitioned. Two years of strife would follow, and all these pink areas would be added by Israel as part of Israel proper. So now we have, out of Palestine, what was Palestine, we have 78% that is considered Israel, and nobody at all even questions that. What are the long-term implications? Growth of Arab armies, military coups, and a move from democratically elected governments in every Arab country to military autocratic rule. Extensive militarization, Soviet bloc moving in, political parties are banned, emergency laws are declared, social services are ignored, and the only party available around to do it is the religious groups, namely the mosque, 
and hence the Muslim Brotherhood thrives and grows. Six day war comes, Israel occupies, the, Egypt, Egypt closes the Gulf of Tehran, Israel retaliates, they take the West Bank and Sinai, so you can imagine the spaghetti bolognese now. <laughs> Post the Six Day War, we have an era of dynastic military rule. The Assads take over in Syria and have been there for 40 years. Saddam Hussein takes over in Iraq. King Hussein takes over in Jordan. Mubarak takes on, of, on in Egypt, etc. Every one of these rules becomes like a 30, 40 year rule and only ends when the father dies and the son is appointed. That's Hafiz al-Assad, Alawite officer. Allied, being a Shiite, is allied with Iran. And he's a threat to Sunni Arab states like Kuwait, Saudi Arabia, and the rest of the Gulf. He would rule from 71 to 2000. The Muslim Brotherhood tries to make some noises in Syria in 1982. He moves in with bulldozers and tanks, demolishes the whole center of the city, within a month turns it into a public park. The bodies, nobody knows how many people were killed, estimates are between five and 15,000. Their, their bodies are still under the park. The son takes over when the father dies. Optimism is short-lived, but the clan continues to run the country. In Iraq, when the king is ousted, Ahmed Hassan al bakr takes over, but his deputy, who is Saddam Hussein, is actually the man wielding the power. And in 79, he takes over. He's our very, very good friend. Uh, he declares war on Iran, starts bombing them and fighting them and pushing them back. We're very happy with what he's doing. And uh, he's a very good friend of our Minister of Defense, uh, Secretary of Defense, thank you. He would gas the Kurds in the north near the border because he thought some of them were cooperating with Iran. About uh, 5,000 would be killed. The media is hush about it. The U.S. government tells them, tone it down, tone it down. Let's not make an issue. They're doing good things. So both in Syria and Iraq, we have secular rule. What, is the, what are the pros and cons? Syria and Iraq were champions of secularism, champions of women's rights, champions of Arab nationalism. All citizens are equal before the law, religion doesn't count. They were ruthless dictators. They constructed a cult of personality, clan and tribe, oversaw multiple human rights abuses, both at home and abroad. Now we have to come a little bit to Islam to understand the ISIS and all the rest of the things. You have the Holy Quran, which is the word of God. Casting concrete cannot be changed, cannot be edited, and only can be in Arabic. There are no translations of the Quran. There are only what is called transliterations, and you have to put the Arabic on top of the English because the point of reference is always the Arabic. There are several disciplines in Islam, schools of jurisprudence, Hanafi, Shafi'i, Maliki, Hanbali, and these go in this order from the most liberal to the most conservative. Under the Hanbali discipline, you have even a more extreme group called the Wahhabis. So, Ibn Saud and Abdul Wahab formed a partnership in 1774. They were very staunch, strict Muslims, and the Saudis wanted to rule. So they said, "We will let you run jurisprudence. We will do. We will be the kings. 
and the partnership was formed. We're still in the era when the Wahhabis, in effect, rule. That's why women cannot drive in Saudi Arabia. Now, we have all been appalled and devastated by the pictures of American and British aid workers and journalists being beheaded. What we don't hear in the press is that this is common practice among Wahhabis in Saudi Arabia. And only last month, eight people were beheaded in Saudi Arabia. That doesn't make the news. That's their internal business. They're protecting the oil for us. They're our good allies. Shh. Just keep it quiet, guys. We don't want to rock the boat. This is only last week, with Kerry trying to get them to support the, our efforts against ISIS. Jihadists are ultra-conservative Muslims who advocate the return to the early days of Islam and how things were run. They don't allow evolution of, poly of religious thought and interpretation and so on. Whatever was done in the first three generations, that's what we will do. Nothing else counts. Now, jihad means struggle. Stri or actually, it means striving in the way of God. Uh, many of the Muslim fundamentalists, now we call jihadis. We call them terrorists, jihadis, and so on. Well, remember, Turkey was the first one to, to declare jihad. <coughs> and a person who undertakes jihad is called a mujahid. And the plural of that is mujahideen. It all comes from the same root, jih root jihad. Now, mujahideen brings something to mind. What does it bring to mind? When the Soviets invaded Afghanistan and wanted to boot them out, Saudi Arabia, Qatar, and the United States worked hand in hand with a brilliant philosophy. Let's bring these ultra-conservative Muslims they're never going to become atheists. <clears throat> Let's train them, arm them, and so on, and let them fight the Soviets, which is what happened. And the Soviets were booted out of there. As soon as we booted the Soviets out, we forgot about it. And we went ahead in our way. And here was a military group. We didn't disband the group. We didn't give them jobs. We didn't give them land. The group was disbanded. Nobody disbanded it. So. You now have an army without a cause. They fought the Soviets and threw them out. Iraq would occupy Kuwait. Bin Laden of Al-Qaeda says, hey guys, I have an army ready. I'll come protect my country. I'll come with hardened fighters to protect it. The king says, come on, this is not serious enough. We have to get, we have an ally in the US. Why would we need them? <laughs> So he rejects it, and Bin Laden decides this is holy land, cannot be, people, women cannot come in tight slacks, and this and that, this is not accepted. Where did Bin Laden learn his religion? In Saudi Arabia. Who taught it to him? The Wahhabis. All the schools in Saudi Arabia today are teaching ultra-conservative Wahhabi Islam to their people. There are four to five million Wahhabis in Saudi Arabia and the Gulf who are ethnically from that area. So we know the rest of the story. In Syria, we have discontent during the Arab Spring. The government cracks down hard. Some parts of the population protest. Wow, this is our opportunity to get rid of the Assad regime. Turkey hates him. Saudi Arabia hates him. Qatar hates him. We hate him. We all pull our resources together. And we will support the opposition. What opposition? God only knows. Somehow, somehow, an estimated 12 to 15,000 jihadis 
from outside the region, from outside of Syria, actually end up in North Syria. What's the only way they can get there? Through Turkey, our staunch ally. Things are getting out of control. But 15,000 warriors went through Turkey with their arms and armament and with Kuwaiti and Qatari arms. And somehow, Turkey that is a police state in a way, especially in Anatolia, every five miles you get stopped for a checkpoint. Somehow nobody saw these guys pass through. They change into ghosts at night and shh, <laughs> slip through. In the morning there's nothing. So we have now a war, a new war in Iraq. A war that was not called for, that was not necessary, that is proven was on false premises. We took, we get, let the genie out of the bottle. While Saddam Hussein was a terrible dictator, at least he kept, he, not at least, I, I don't know what to say, but he kept the country together. We made two grave mistakes when we got in. First, we disbanded the Iraqi army because they are Hussein's army. Well, they are human beings, they are individuals. They have been recruited to the army. We lost a huge fighting power and spent 10 years to create our own fighting power using the same people trying to bring them back in. We also 